Texas, 1867. This is the true story of 15 brave men and women who traveled back in time, daring to live as the early cowboys and ranchers did over 130 years ago. These modern day adventurers will endure two and a half months of heat and hardship, a test of true grit. But do they have what it takes to succeed on Texas Ranch House? Funding for Texas Ranch House is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. After seven long days on the cattle drive, the cowboys are nearing the army outpost at Fort Santiago, where Mr. Cook plans to sell the herd. Hours of preparation have led to this moment, and we're only one day's drive from Fort Santiago, which means this thing is close to being over. Okay, okay, it's okay. Mr. Cook has spent most of the drive at the ranch with his family. He now faces his biggest challenge of the summer selling his cattle at a high enough price to pay off his debts and make a profit. I'm about to start a journey to catch up with the cowboys and driving the herd to market. It's been really, really hot lately, like in the hundreds and high humidity, and it's been stifling during the day. All right, where's my family? Gotta go. Okay, hello. See you in a couple days, okay? Mr. Cook will have to ride for a full day to catch up with the cattle drive at their final camp. Can make some money. My mission is to sell the cattle for the best price I can get. If we don't sell enough cattle, we won't be able to make our, our payment for the land. And if we don't make our payment for the land, we lose the ranch. So this is something we have to make happen. With more than 10 miles to cover on the last day of the drive, the cowboys face another long day in the saddle. Are they ivory stair? The novelty of life on the trail has long worn off. Pushing this many cattle is pretty hard. And we're only getting five hours of sleep a night. You know, you can do that for a couple of weeks, but for two months, I just can't imagine how they did that. It's just like molasses. Jared's a little anxious about everything. He's freaking out a little bit this morning. When it's 114 degrees, they're walking literally at a quarter mile an hour. And it's like herding toothpaste at that point, back into the bottle. As they move slowly forward, the cowboys and their herd come across something that they weren't expecting. Holy shit, that's weird. Their trail takes them right across a road, something they haven't seen for 10 weeks. The highway patrol has been brought in to stop the traffic and allow our 19th century caravan to cross. It was like, oh man, a road. <laughs> Look at that, asphalt. And the cows are the same way. They walk up to it and they're like, what's that? <laughs> Freaky weird. I just come back from Wonderland. Seeing the road after all this time is the weirdest thing I could possibly imagine. It's just snapping back to reality. And to be quite frank, I suddenly realized I don't want to leave. If I see a house, I'm probably going to cry. Imagine the first day you want to deodorant. It. it smelled good. <laughs> I smell like man. To me, it says, it says you're coming to the end of this thing. That's what it really says. It, it pretty much looks like the road out of here. 
seeing this and hearing noises of cars and things is just bizarre now. It's just, just weird. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Traveling much faster than the grazing herd, after seven hours, Mr. Cook catches up with the chuck wagon and remuda ahead of the drive. Everybody seems to be in pretty good shape, spirits-wise. Um, I think we had one horse go down uh, with bad feet, but it, everybody else seems OK. He will ride with them to the final camp. It's so smeared with fly guts that you can't see through it. Back at the ranch, the women have been taking things easy, despite the fact that there is a new challenge looming. Once the cattle sale is completed, the ranch and its occupants will be evaluated by a team of experts. But Mrs. Cook and her daughters have been otherwise occupied by a more immediate crisis. It's an infestation of flies. It's awful. We actually fought, fought them back in the other rooms and got it down to where we, we just sat in the parlor the whole day. <laughs> I never really noticed the stink around here <laughs> until you couldn't open a window. And all of a sudden, we're all in there sweating together, and it's, it's really awful. Everything has flies in the morning. Um, we milked the cow and the goat. Flies fall in, always. <laughs> it's really gross. This is our fly-infested kitchen. Can't deal with this anymore. They're horrible by the windows and stuff. See, look at that. That's what it's like on our windows and in here. It's just so disgusting. And we can't cook in here anymore. And I think we're all going insane right now. Mrs. Cook starts cleaning up the dishes that have been left out since the party she held on the eve of the cattle drive eight days ago. But the fly problem began when the cowboys did not dispose of manure far enough away from the house. And without them around to help, it has gotten even worse. Washing the dishes now won't make much difference. OK, hold up, hold up. Get under Riding it. ahead of the drive, Sean and the chuck wagon arrive at the final camp. Providing meals for the crew has been a real challenge for the 19-year-old cook. Yeah, I'm counting days to leave. I, it wasn't my intention. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of cool aspects. But for me, the, the bad is kind of outweighing the good at this point. Cattle drives were hard on all who worked on them, and the drives of 1867 were especially tough. Heavy rains, stampedes, and disease left thousands of dead cows along the trail. But the Cook Ranch hands have made it to their final camp without losing a single cow, and with all of the herd in prime health. We're nearly here. I'm nearly here, I'm nearly here, I'm nearly here. I'm nearly here, yes. We're basically almost done with our job. I mean, it makes me feel good knowing that I'm, my job is almost completed. We felt really good about what we did and, and how we did it, and nobody got injured. I mean, we stuck together. We learned a lot together. It was just an awesome experience. We always knew it was hard work. It's dirty. You get wet. You get hot, whatever. But it's the satisfaction you get when you bring in those cows. You know you went out and you tracked them, and you found them, and you brought them in. I mean, that's, I think that's really satisfying. You see here? Yeah. It is the morning of the cattle sale, and Mr. Cook's hour has come. Corporal, riders approaching! He goes ahead of the herd to announce to the army that his cattle are on the way. It is up to Mr. Cook alone to negotiate a price for his herd that will make his ranch profitable. The success of the ranch is totally dependent on this sale. The guy's wages are dependent on this sale. It's a huge day for us. Welcome, sir. Howdy. Welcome from Santiago. Thank you very much. How are you? Pleasure to see you. Would you like to dismount? I would certainly love to. If I can remember how to walk. Oh, yes. Present or. Although fictitious, Fort Santiago is based on the actual frontier forts that were being rebuilt or established after the Civil War. Waiting for orders, sir. The Army needed beef to feed its soldiers and sought to buy it from local cattle ranchers. But Mr. Cook will have to bargain to get a good price for his herd. 
Captain Morgan, this is Mr. Cook. How are you doing, sir? How are you doing, sir? How are you doing? Good to see you. Tom Saunders. Hey, Tom. Tom Saunders, a fifth-generation rancher whose family has been buying and selling cattle since the late 1800s, has been hired to buy beef for the fort. Cattle hold together pretty well. We didn't lose one. No so fights, no bumps, no bruises. All them boys no, still getting along. No, they're getting along. If you'll send uh, your man, I'll send a man with him, and I'd like for him to count those cattle through that gate. Robbie makes the final tally. Should be plenty of beef on them. Some steers, a few bulls in there. Hopefully, Mr. Saunders here can pick out the ones that we like. So well, just to let you know, I'm interested in selling you the whole herd. The whole herd? Yes, sir. The final count confirms that all 131 head have made it to the fort. This is Robbie. Robbie. Nice Tom Saunders. Tom. Nice to meet you, sir. Here's what we want to do. We want to start on those big yearlings first. Anything like from 400 pounds on up, and then they'll come right into this trap. Tom instructs the cowboys to separate or cut the mature steers from the calves and their mothers. It's black and white, that bull. I like the dry red heifer that goes along with him. For the Army, the most attractive cows are the full-grown steers that are ready for slaughter. They have little interest in buying cattle to rear or in breeding stock. You can go ahead and cut that red bull in there for now. Mr. Cook has failed to realize that not all his cows are of equal value. But to make the profit he needs, he must sell the entire herd. What we'd like to do is throw everything in there and see just exactly what we want, and we'll trade on one set right there. Is that kosher with you? I'm going to need a few more head than that, so... Well, we're not through yet. That black and white heifer right there. That's what we're looking for. All three of them. The broker on behalf of the Army, he knew his stuff inside and out and was pretty intimidating to deal with. Oh, that's good. That whole little bunch right there, Robbie. Big red steer and this yellow steer on the outside. Big red heifer on the outside. That big old stag yearling there would do good, too. All three of them's good, Robbie. As Tom's selection continues, things are not looking good for Mr. Cook. We'll take that bull. Only about three cows in every five are making the cut. All these cattle are in good flesh. There's just some of these calves that are on them cows that are still a little bit green yet. Yeah. Mr. Cook's plan to sell the whole herd now seems in jeopardy. It's all right if I go in there and cut the herd and see if there's anything left in there that the Army can use. All right. At larger open markets, such as the Abilene Trailhead, which opened in 1867, other ranchers from the north would often buy the Texas cattle that did not make the first cut. But Mr. Cook does not have this option. Here's what I'd like to do with you, Mr. Cook, on these cattle right here. What we're really wanting to do is, is trade on this pen right here. And I'm going to say there's probably yeah, good 86 90. or 90 head of cattle in there. Well. I came to deal the whole herd. We can talk about this as your primary target for, right. uh, for purchase. And uh, if these are less, less in demand over here, we still need to sell them. These calves right here are just a little bit too green to pick. You'd have to wait another three months on them. But I'd like to know what you wanted for these cattle that we got sorted. Let me do some figuring. I knew what I had to get, and I wanted a little surplus from what I had to get. Uh, I did not go into that expecting to play hardball and negotiate for the every last dime I could get out of things. If I could get $25 a head for everything, I'd come out OK, and I think that'd be fair. All right. Let's see how many they got. What was the tally? 91 hit. 91 hit. With only 91 selected from his 131 Longhorn, Mr. Cook is in serious trouble. He must somehow convince the Army to buy the rest of his herd. Captain Morgan, I think this is what's going to be most desirable to feed your men with. It I is. got you three good milk cows in there, and ain't a cow in there that don't have a bad bag on it. No. And I think that, that's a fair price, and I don't think we'll be able I to I agree. It. it is a fair price. It's a, it's a good looking bunch of animals. Mr. Cook. There's 91 head on your account. Is that what your man came up with? That's good to you, Robbie. Be asking for $25, and I think since you're here early, and uh, 
I think that that's a good buy for the Army, and we'd like to trade it 25 bucks if that's all right with you. Okay. We'd like to so call we got, it a deal. So we got another, uh, how many head over here, 40? Uh, I think there's gonna be 20 pair over there. What I could do is I could let, let them go at a lesser price per head. Something like maybe 20 bucks a head. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll give you 15 bucks round for them, 25 for all that. I'd go 18 for these, 25 for those. Can't I can't afford to let them go less. That's fair price. I think we have a deal, sir. A deal indeed. Somehow Mr. Cook has succeeded in selling his entire herd, even managing to get $18 per head for his mothers and calves. Well, that's pretty good trading. I'm glad I didn't have to shoot you. For never doing it before. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna be a cowman, old cookie. I guess so. This is a voucher that will guarantee your payment. There you go, Mr. Cook. Fair deal, thank you very much. You Triumphant at achieving a successful cattle drive and sale, Mr. Cook and his cowboys set off on the 50-mile ride back to the ranch. This has been a life journey out here. I've personally learned a lot. I've been faced with manager challenges that I've never faced in my real life, and have had to rise to those occasions. I'm very proud of the boys. We started out with 131 and ended with 131. It's just and everything in between there. We stuck together, we learned a lot together. It was just an awesome experience. We did what we had to do to get that many cattle to market, and uh, I think we accomplished our goals. Next day, after a long, hot journey, the cowboys arrive back at the ranch and are greeted by Mrs. Cook in her underwear. Hi, good evening. Hi. So glad to see you. <laughs> How did Mike go? Well, we survived it. We keep, we keep the ranch. <laughs> we get to keep the ranch. <laughs> yep. We don't work here no more. The next day, it's time for the cowboys to get paid. Mr. Cook, fresh from his success at the cattle sale, is determined to drive hard bargains with his men. Well, gentlemen, Today's payday. Uh -huh. So what I'm going to do is uh, start with Robbie. I wanted to give the guys a chance to buy a horse if they wanted to, because I felt like they all uh, had earned, earned that right. OK. My dad decided to sit down and pay all the guys their wages. Of course, the girls were eavesdropping and listening to all the deals going down. My dad was being kind of like a hard dealer, but he was fair, I think. I'm going to be paying you for three months' pay, $105. Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. uh, we can talk horses, or if you don't want a horse, that's fine too. How much do you want for Bravo? Well, you know, you know as well as I know, Bravo is the top horse in here. Mm -hmm. Sixty bucks. Sixty bucks. That's a little too much. Okay, it's all right. But I mean, I'm just he's worth a lot to me, though. Yeah. Well, you got to remember that who was riding Bravo. That's right. Good rider was on Bravo. Hard on. I give you that horse for fifteen dollars. I'm gonna say 13 since we get we, since we did get 131 head. Let's make it 13. All right. You want that horse? I'll take 13. Change the numbers a little bit, but that's okay. okay. Shake on them so you can't go back. <laughs> I'm not gonna go back on that. On that 13 dollar. That's a sealed deal. It's All a right. sealed deal. Yeah. You got the horse. Okay. The tone kind of changed when Robbie came back and told me that Mr. Cook was selling horses and the prices had gone up considerably. And then I was relieved that I'd already purchased mine. Brown though a few weeks earlier and offered $25 because suddenly all the horses were $40 to $60. Welcome to payday. Thank you. So I got you at $60. Okay. If you're interested in any horses, Beautiful. I'm interested in listening. Well, I'm going to talk to you about Huey. Okay. He's, he's a young horse, a four-year-old. Yeah. So I figure he'd probably be worth maybe 16 bucks. No, he's not even close. I got him rated as, a, as about a $40 horse to me. Wow. That's an outrageous price. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. And that's it. I ain't gonna buy one. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Sanders. It doesn't take long for the cowboys to realize that Mr. Cook is not offering any deals. Honey, afternoon. How you doing? Come have a seat, sir. Thank you. In regard to horses, I mean, travel would probably be anyone I want. So, you know, my final offer for him is $27.
30. My final offer. That's compromise, 28.50. OK. Well, I guess I'll, I'll keep my money. OK. Thank you very much, then. All right. They're all kind of surprised, but it was nothing totally unexpected until um, Jared came. It's held up. We've been here before. Jared had bought his horse Brownlow from Mr. Cook for $25. But later, when Jared and Brownlow were held hostage by the Comanche, Mr. Cook was forced to pay a price for their return. Now, we have probably the most difficult discussion to have of anybody here because I ended up trading a bit of herd cows to buy you and to buy that horse back. He says, we have something very difficult to, to discuss. It's your horse Brownlow. And at that point, I knew it was coming up, and I was kind of shocked. He began selling me my own horse. The way I look at it is I'm good with setting you free from the Comanches. But at this point, I bought the horse back, and it's my horse again. Well, sir, Brownlow is my horse. And uh, unless you have anything that you can do about it, I'll be riding out on him. I bought the horse back. I'll stop you. OK. You're in the business of buying stolen horses then? Are you a horse thief now? Are you a horse trader now? We shook in Texas when you shake. It's a serious thing. You know what? We shook. And your horse got stolen from you. You lost your horse. Sir, I rode back on my horse. As far as I'm concerned, it's... you paid 25 cows for three horses and weren't paying attention when we rode out of there. Oh, I was paying attention. I was paying attention that, uh, I got ripped off in a big way. Well, I'm and, sorry for and, that, but there's nothing I, I can do about it. I did not have to buy your freedom, but I did. You didn't buy my freedom. I was set free. I bought your freedom. I've been an honorable man to you, and I won't get into a bloodbath. I could, and if you care to, I will go there. All I'm going to do is ride out here on the horse that I purchased. I'll beat the sh out of you if you try. You go for it. I will. Well, I guess we'll I will see be honest with time. you, though. I will give you your wages. You're due nineteen dollars and fifteen cents. I'll take it, and I'll make that out to you right now. Make that out. I'll take it in silver, sir. Don't have any silver, no. but I'll give you a banknote, <laughs> which is just as better. You can keep your banknote. Good day, okay. sir. Mrs. Cook has been listening to this conversation. You're awesome. OK. I love you. Good. Thank you. Love too. You're amazing. I was so mm. proud of you. It was just like a basic feeling that you have as a woman <laughs> watching your man just <laughs> take over. And I was like, oh, god, he's so awesome. He's loony. You're amazing. He's loony and I'm amazing? Uh, we'll see. I don't know why he turned down the pay. And I will beat the shit out of him if he tries to leave on that horse. What a prick. It comes right down to it, that man. It works on a completely different level than everyone out here. You'll see tomorrow morning, you'll see me ride out of that horse. We'll see if he makes one step for me. I want to see Mr. Cook beat the shit out of him. I, know. I would too. It's <laughs> awesome. It's a long time coming. <laughs> the beauty of Jared, though, is all you have to do is let him talk. Yeah. And he digs his own grave, he jumps in the coffin, and he puts the dirt over the top of him. I mean, it's it's sad, actually. So he's going to whoop your ass? Yeah, I would. Yeah, he thinks he's going to beat the shit out of you, He's going to beat the shit out of me. It's a promise he's made, but we'll see if he keeps it. I'm concerned about the exchange with Jared, and I'm feeling that it would be customary to ask him to leave the ranch today. It's a very valid point. He quit. And you don't want somebody of that character on this ranch living amongst us. I don't want my girls at risk. He has a very dark place inside of him, and it's obviously been brewing for a very long time. OK. Done. You're a good man. Done. Proud of you. OK. He requested payment in silver. What do you think about paying him off in silver? Do you have silver? Probably come up with it. Mr. Picklin. 
Yes, sir. Mr. Cook is about to experience the wrath of Jared. <laughs> Rock! <laughs> Rock! <laughs> you uh, asked to be paid in silver. Yes, sir. I managed to find the coins, mm -hmm. pull together the silver. So I would like to accept your, uh, your resignation right now. I'll pay you in silver. I'm not quitting. Then you're fired and you're paid up. I want you off the ranch in half an hour. He just gave him something. Cash. End of story. And I'm dead serious. To think I ever had respect for you, sir. No, jump off the ropes, Jared. That was perfect. Jump off the ropes, padded elbow, clothesline. Mr. Ficklin will be leaving the ranch. Appreciate you letting him have the space he needs. Thanks. Why is that? Did he get fired? Mr. Kirk, why is that? Mr. Kirk? Jared? Go on, brother. Get your horse, brother. Ride right him out. So if he takes the horse, he's a horse thief. Are you not going to do anything? No. Jerry, we had a pact. We're leaving with you. Thanks, sir. We're with you, brother. Thank you, Anders. We all decide together that if one of us left, that we'd all leave together. And as we're men of our words, we all decided to leave with Jared. Take him, Bravo. No, I bought a horse. I'm taking my horse. They're all stealing horses? Bravo if he takes horse. Bravo, then he is He's stealing. stealing. We were been mistreated and everything, you know? I, I don't have anything to say to him, anything good. I think the best thing is for him to just go back to his little world and be pushed around by mama. Because we know who wears the pants, and people out there know who wears the pants. Just because she wears a skirt doesn't mean she doesn't have pants underneath. They don't understand that it takes everybody. They wouldn't have had jobs if it hadn't been for ranch owners. We try to be nice to them. I know. We're not bad people. We're not the ones storming off. That just sucks, man. He's such a cock. <laughs> Idiot. Uh, yeah, I've already cried with Johnny, and we, I mean, this is this is this is not the way we wanted to go. So he can take his fountain pen and shove it somewhere. No, the season is over. You made your money. You don't need hands for the winner. You, really you don't have to feed them for so two no, more nights. You win. Can we go home today? I've never been fired before in my whole life. This is the first time. I'll tell you what, I don't feel bad about it. I know I'm doing the right thing. It's two days more, and he can't. Oh, my God, what an idiot. It hurts like hell to leave, but we're keeping our word for Jared and for us, That's for good. a group. Yeah. And he hasn't kept one word. Sad as this is, it's also beautiful in a way as well because it illustrates the, the companionship and the camaraderie and the stick together spirit of the cowboy. Is he going to see what he's going to do now when he walks out in Brahma? Well, is he going to keep his word? Yeah, is that's, he? No, that's going to be interesting. You know, he said is he's he going to sh by Jerry, <laughs> but what's going to happen now? Has he got the balls to even do that? I doubt it. Given his track record, though, and if I was betting, I'd, I'd bet against him just staying right there on his front porch. You know the quote, real quick? Come up with Johnny's stuff. Put it just in there. Put it in the bench. I want to walk by that house alone. There was no doubt I was going to get brown low, and I was going to ride out of this ranch. And I did. And I did it with my head held high.
Jerry was threatening to steal a horse. But I, we don't have a shotgun to stand there and say, that's my horse. And then we realized in the end, you know, let him take it, because what he's done is he's proved exactly what we've said. He is a thief. Mr. Cook? Yes. Some of the guys want to say something? Right ahead. I just like to say, I'm sorry we have to leave like this, but I hope you understand that we stick together. I understand. And I'm sorry you had to act like that to fire Jared. Maybe someday everybody will understand, but it, but it was the right thing to do. I'm just sorry I had to end like this. Me too. We all are. Real sorry to have to end like this. I wish you the best of luck next season on your ranch. I feel like I worked for Robbie. I don't really know that I know you that much and didn't see you much. So. You could have tried too, Rob. Not oh, once really? you ever talked to me. What's that? You'd never ever talk to me, ever. Oh, when did we you have to argue with me? Just get over it. There's no point all arguing now. I was talking to Rob, Johnny. Yeah, I know you were, but there's no point arguing now. Well, it's stopped. Making comments. She's you guys can't keep making comments and we said just, just sit here. You didn't come over here to argue. No. Then right. stop making then comments. Then go. Leave. We don't want you here. Yada, yada, yada. I had a hard time containing myself when they were leaving. I get passionate when it's my honor or my family's honor and, and you're saying what horrible people we are, or, but I wish you the best. We got right. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> I wish you the best. No, don't even do that, just leave. I feel lost and dazed and hurt. It just sort of recaps the whole summer in one moment, like it meant nothing to them. This has been brewing for a while. It's hard to feel like it didn't mean anything to the guys that we worked so hard and it didn't matter to them. Like, they thought when they were on the cattle drive that we sat around doing nothing. Just riding off the ranch, it was, it was tough. I've never, I don't know, it's been a long time, maybe I have, but I've never just uncontrollably not been able to stop myself from crying. You know, all the guys are actually very upset just because to leave so suddenly just really hits you and you just, you just feel really empty and lost. It's unfortunate how it had to play out today, but I'm not surprised either, and, and, and uh, it's tiring, it's exhausting, but if you're standing by your principles and you're standing by what you've said, it's not that exhausting. It's the right thing, and, and the right thing happened, and it's too bad it happened the way it did, but it's over, and now we're moving on. I hope we never see them again. With the sudden departure of the Cowboys, the final assessment of the ranch by historical experts has almost been forgotten. The Cook family and their one remaining ranch hand, Mora, will now face the assessors alone. The assessment was kind of a big mystery to me. I didn't know what was gonna happen. My clear objective was make a profit on the ranch. I don't know how the assessment will turn out because everybody has a different perception of what things should have been like and would have been like. And However it turns out, I'm really proud of what we've done. As the man in charge, Mr. Cook will be held accountable for whether or not his ranch has succeeded and will go on to be a viable business. Going forward, I'm 100% confident that we could uh, take this ranch into the future and, and, and continue to make, make a profit and, and, and grow its net worth as well. He didn't make the, the ranch a success. We made the ranch a success. Mr. Cook didn't do squat. No matter what he did, he didn't actually directly do anything, really, apart from try to manage us. All you have to do is live here and make it work. That's the one thing that the cooks did not do. They, they didn't embrace it and make it work. The Cook Ranch is being assessed by experts who helped train the participants for life in 1867. Melissa Guerra is a culinary historian and descendant of the McAllen family, who have been ranching since the 1860s. Guess do we just go on in? I reckon to leave. Jim Fluger is the executive director of the National Ranching Heritage Center at Texas Tech University. And Craig Carter has been an expert wrangler for 18 years. Good to Hello, see friends. you again. 
Duncan. Hi. Good to see you. How are you, you doing? Look lovely. The assessors will also get the chance to talk to the cowboys, who are resting about a mile from the Cook Ranch. Well, come on up. Mrs. Cook has been cleaning for the last 24 hours, but the flies are still so bad that the lunch she's prepared will have to be eaten inside the parlor. What we thought we would do is actually buffet style, and then we can go and hide in the parlor like we usually do and eat in there. So one? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what do you usually have for lunch, and what do you usually have for dinner? Lunch is usually beans and tortillas. And veggies. And mm -hmm. veggies. Nice. Have a pizza. To make their evaluation, the assessors must consider the events of the past two and a half months. Oh, oh, look at the I can't see. Oh. It all began when Mr. Cook and his family arrived, charged with turning a rundown ranch into a viable business. What do you think, babe? It's huge. Yeah. <laughs> when we bought the ranch, we paid half down, and then we got four installments to pay the remainder. So the first installment is due um, in September. Was there a financial plan or goals that you had in mind when you well, came here? Well, as an entrepreneur, you want a return on your investment. We've certainly achieved a return on our investment. Mr. Cook's men started off by building a corral for the cattle they would eventually claim. As the cowboys worked on improving the infrastructure of the ranch, Mrs. Cook saw it as her most important duty to turn a house into a home. These are actually little corn husk stalls that I've created, and then I've been doing little pillows and quilt blocks, so it was a lot of fun. How long did it take you to build each one of these? Um, probably about a day from start to finish. And I can take you here in the back bedroom. It stays fairly cool, so we keep our potatoes in here, our salt pork is in here. This room is um, actually shared by Mora and my oldest daughter, Vienna. If you notice cheesecloth in the windows, it's because, and you've also noticed in here, we are definitely feeling the infestation of flies. And this is our kitchen, and the first thing you'll notice is the hum of the flies, and um, it has been our aggravation for the last two months, and, I, and I'm sure that this was probably one of the the terrors of women in 1867. <laughs> Mr. Cook presents his ledger. This book was the foundation of a 19th century ranch containing detailed accounts of cattle sales and other business ventures. Didn't y'all make some shirts? I made some. Anna's shirt. We made a shirt with the soldier. The soldier yeah. How much you get for your shirts? A uh, dollar fifty. We did mending for the ranch hands. So we sold um, a shirt to a gentleman on the military, and we do now have a viable business, and we've proven, you know, a quality service. I've spoken to your wife about the sales mm -hmm. of her mm -hmm. sewing efforts. Mm -hmm. Do you have any? of those entries in the, in the ledger. Who bought a shirt? Anders did. Okay, Anders bought a shirt for $1.50. So, um, keeping in mind that this this method of accounting is a cash accounting method, which isn't what we use nowadays. And so, so showing the shirt business as a separate business, we really didn't do. Well, come on in. Welcome to the garden. The Cook family was provided with an abundant vegetable garden that should have provided the basis of their diet. OK, what do we got? But as Melissa discovered on an earlier visit, the stuff is getting kind of baked. The garden was badly tended and generally underused as a food source. The garden has been a huge boon for us, not only a source of food on a daily basis, but also for um, produce sales as well. So and who have you been selling them to? Trading with the freighter mm -hmm. and with the military. In, in the vegetable garden, do you have any estimates on how much The, that the vegetable garden, two transactions with the freighter, we... Um... On early ranches, it was considered vital to keep a meticulous record of every single business transaction, purchase, sale, or trade. I will tell you that it was about $4.50 each time that, that we bartered for, so. for produce with the freighter. So the freighter would have this invoice, and then there would be the add-on items, and then there would be a reduction to those add-ons based on what we bartered. Do you and have any of those invoices? Yeah. Just a second. Being out here without a computer, without a calculator, without an eraser for a pencil has been a bit challenging. So so we ordered all these items. OK. And I do have some pieces of paper that indicated that. So there's not really any real recording of? Well, if you want to see it, I will show it to you. You just have to be patient. Okay. Mr. Cook had to make a speedy transition from hospital administrator to frontiersman. 
Just days into the project, events called for the dismissal of his foreman, Stan, and Mr. Cook had to promote the only candidate that was experienced enough for the job. Loyalty is my number one criteria. Loyalty to me and the ranch. It turned out that everybody was loyal to the foreman. The work ethic of the cowboys under their new foreman, Robbie, was brought into question, resulting in bitter conflict. You guys should be riding 10 hours a day at least. What you do is you go out for four to six hours, come back, take a three-hour siesta. Well, That's what, shut up, I'm not talking to you. If you don't tell the truth, then it's I am stupid. telling the truth. Right now, you keep your mouth shut. Well, did you expect it to be as difficult as it is? You know, nice guy style does not suit this kind of work environment out here tough guy approach is a far more effective method. As a result of Mr. Cook's tough stance, a deep hostility grew between the ranch hands and the Cook family. He should have never given that speech. He should apologize to us for giving that speech in the manner that he gave it, and he should have kept his word. None of them quit, and they started performing. And so, basically, I had to sleep with one eye open from then on out. I had to watch out for my wife and my daughters. I don't really need a maid. I have three daughters and myself. The Cowboys felt that Mr. Cook's decision-making was unduly influenced by his wife. When he's by himself and talking to me, I actually like him. You know, he's fair, he's just. And then occasionally he makes these crazy decisions. And for me, his wife must have a, a part in that. You, as ranch owner's wife, what was your relationship with the rest of the employees? I tried to forge a working relationship with the cowboys, but I don't think the cowboys were educated in terms of what would the rancher's wife's role be. So there was a huge amount of resistance from the beginning. Maybe you guys could do this for us. <laughs> it's all stand and watch. For their part, the cowboys showed an increasing lack of respect towards the women on the yeah, ranch. Yeah, we would help you, but it's just not going to help you in the long run. It was a very difficult battle to face. Every conversation demeaned every activity on this ranch that a woman was allowed to do, and then demeaned me for trying to do something else. I was wondering if you'd be interested in helping us out a little bit on some riding time. I would love to. The promotion of Mora from girl of all work to ranch hand further added to the breakdown in the key relationship on the ranch, that of the owner and his foreman. Can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Mora, how all that worked out or didn't work out? Or... With Mora, it was just, uh, instead of asking me to hire somebody, he did it on his own without my consent. We felt that we had a loyalty in her and a sense of respect that of any ranch hand, I felt the most comfortable in employing her as a ranch hand because ultimately that's what you lean on. I understand that you had some dealings with Comanches along the way. Tell us about that. No comment. Yeah. Just kidding. We've talked about four horses. We didn't talk about Jarrett. He's not on the table for negotiation. We let him stay with you. He didn't stay because he wanted to, did he? When Jared was captured by Comanche, Mr. Cook refused to bargain for his freedom. Any hope of reconciliation between him and his ranch hands was dashed. 25 cattle, four horses, and Jarrett. I don't barter for people. You don't like Jarrett? I don't know what went on with the negotiations back at the house. I heard Mr. Cook would not deal for me. And uh, when the Comanche came back, they told me that, I guess you're, you're staying here, Jared, because they wouldn't deal for you. <laughs> so I gather from what you're saying, the uh, Comanches let Jared go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, what do Nobody you died. Pardon? <laughs> Nobody died. Well, that's, that's, that's good. The assessors convened behind closed doors to discuss their findings and decide the fate of the Cook Ranch. My grandmother kept the books painstakingly writing down every fact and figure regarding every head of cattle, regarding every expenditure. Mr. Cook's ledger and its inaccuracies is a major concern to the assessors. There are some things that he's mentioned about how he sold the horse, uh, how he got income from somebody for selling produce and so forth. Some of that doesn't show up in here. On the short term, yeah, I could say he could probably he probably did make a profit, and I think he did very good in his sale of the cattle. Do you think that was kind of beginner's luck, though? Yeah, I think it was, because he's admitted that he didn't know anything about cattle, about selling cattle. Crucially, Mr. Cook's lack of a crew as winter sets in and the likelihood of finding a new one is brought into question. Where is he getting the workforce in 1867? And two, how's he going to pay for them? 
The assessors are concerned by Mr. Cook's disdain for his men, especially in light of how he bargained for Jared's life. If I were the employer, I would have paid the 25 head, gotten everybody back, and I would have said to the cowboys, this is wild caught cattle, let's go out and get more. Yeah. I saved your buddy, now I need your help so that we can make this a good cattle sale. What's a renewable source here? It's just what you say, the, the cattle. He can go out and get more, more cattle. It's going to be more difficult for him to get another experienced hen. You know, he's losing that resource that he needs the most, mm -hmm. and that's a hired hen. Someone who knows the country. If he hires someone new, are they going to know this part of the world? Mm -hmm. You know? So there's a learning curve there that you have to do all over again. I want to address the role of the women on the ranch. I was a little concerned with what I had seen in the kitchen, in the home. Um, you know, the food that was stored on the floor, food left on plates, dishes left unwashed, slop buckets left right outside the door. The fly problem has been just abominable. I mean, as we are sitting here with this assessment, the flies are all over us. You know, I, I can't believe that the garden hadn't been harvested completely. I can't believe that the stalls, you know, weren't in better shape and that the manure was right in front of the front door. No wonder there was flies. No wonder. The participants have refused to gather together as a group, so it has been decided that they will receive their assessment by mail after they return home. For the Cook family, after two and a half months, their time on the ranch has come to an end. I love you. I love you. I love you. Howie's going to miss the goats. He likes to chase the goats. Hi, sweetie. Don't get me dirty. I'm going to miss sunsets. I think I'll miss the quiet. It's so peaceful and quiet out here. But I, I'm, I'm not going to miss it, like having to work and like use Dutch ovens. and It's like I never want to see a dirty dish. At this point, I'm very excited to go home. It's been a real long time, so <laughs> I'm ready. These two have spent a lot of time on my bed. The deed to our land. My only one flip-flop that Howie did not destroy. <laughs> if this was really 1867, I think that I would either become an outlaw or an actress. I'd probably never get married. I'd probably never be stable. I'd probably become like Calamity Jane, and that would be a huge tragedy. Yeah. Hi, <laughs> Mora. Mr. Cook. Mm. Okay. Thanks for staying with us. You're welcome. Woo! Bye, guys. Bye. 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 See you soon. Time to go. Time to go. I remember the very first night, about a month into being here, that I didn't have any lights and it was pitch dark in this room. And I knew I needed something in my washstand. And I was able to come in, walk my way, feel, and actually put my hand on the knob of my drawer without hitting anything else. <laughs> and I thought, I really know this house and it's our home. So, yeah. I will miss it. Okay, say goodbye to the ranch for the season. By outhouse. Our outhouse. Oh. We grow a lot of time in that house. I'm ready. Three months after his experience on the ranch, Jared Ficklin is back behind the computer screen. I realized my greatest fear that I'm just right back at work, right back at the desk, right back at the laptop. Mora has swapped shoveling manure for aspirations of a loftier kind. I'm working on my PhD in anthropology at Stanford. I'm really interested in gender issues and sexuality in the construction of gender. Gym teacher Rob Wright came away with something more than just memories of Texas. He has his horse hammer, too. Still adjusting to the Colorado climate from Texas. Sean returned to his mom, dad, and seven siblings with a new maturity. Who wants a corner piece? Me. I 
have changed. I, I did do some growing up down there and uh, I may not be that immature life of the party kind of a guy that I used to be before, but it's okay because it's for the better. That's good, John. You can make all the cornbread. Absolutely. Mr. Cook is still reflecting on the difficulties he faced managing his crew on the ranch. I didn't have any idea that I would be right smack in, in the middle of uh, uh, controversy and conflict. I wasn't expecting to have the mental challenges that I had. I am a really lucky girl because I have a husband who will go out way outside his comfort zone, and that's what he did. We came out a stronger, more loving, more faithful family. And to me, that's a huge success. Finally, the participants discover how they have been assessed by the historical experts. Did they live up to the heroic ranchers who forged a new industry in post-Civil War Texas? Would the ranch they started survive and prosper in the years ahead? Well, how I think we did and how I think it'll be assessed might be two different things, um, but I don't think too far apart, and um, I think we did great. Generally speaking, all the participants committed fully to the Texas Ranch House experience. Dedicating long hours in the saddle are the home. The defining moment for the Cook Ranch was the success of the cattle drive. In which the participants rounded up 130 head of cattle and drove them to market. However, it is difficult to determine the true return of Mr. Cook's investment because he did not adequately maintain the Cook Register. In essence, the ledger was indecipherable, most of the entries requiring explanation for Mr. Cook based on mental recall. Much of the success of the cattle drive can be attributed to Foreman Robbie Cavasuela. Hey, one of us. The cow hands were clearly dedicated to their work, but their loyalty was tempered with a sophomoric behavior, particularly towards the women of the Cook household, of a nature that would have been unthinkable in 1867. Mrs. Cook was a loyal confidant to her husband and remained steadfast to her ideals and principles. She provided a solid domestic foundation for her daughters and Mora, but the Cook women did not prove that they worked to their potential for the welfare of the ranch. Much time was spent on crafting items like dolls, while industrious projects were initiated without much follow through. Regrettably, the short-term financial success of the cattle sale does not indicate long-term viability for the Cook Ranch. In fact, we believe the ranch would not survive another year. The ranch faces failure because of poor personnel management on the part of Mr. Cook and a lack of respect from his employees. Throughout the season, the Cook family and their cowhounds found it difficult to maintain any sort of mutual respect and became increasingly critical and distrustful of each other. The disharmony presented Mrs. Cook with an opportunity for greatness. However, rather than embrace the, you know, why are we reading this? Mrs. Cook quietly undermined ranch harmony and failed to realize the full potential of her position in the ranch hierarchy. With the disintegration of labor relations and ultimately the mass resignation by the cowboy crew. <laughs> the reality he faces is that qualified cow hands were scarce in post-Civil War Texas. He has lost his most valuable resource and will likely never be able to replace it. it. Says right there. Kindness, selflessness, and common courtesy were required for a ranch to endure in the unforgiving conditions of 19th century Texas. Without exception, the participants showed too few of these virtues, and all have failed in the face of history. But as employer, Mr. Cook must be held ultimately responsible, and it is he who will witness the demise of the Cook Ranch. Wow. I think it's bullshit. I think it's pretty spot on. <laughs> I was deeply offended. How dare you say that my father is responsible for the failure of this ranch? We cannot control the actions of other people. Hard work was recognized, yeah. You got to have your cowboys to keep going. I have the only utmost respect for my parents, and those cowboys are probably sitting here right now laughing at us. I don't care. We were asked to be our 21st century selves, trying to exist in a 19th century space with 19th century tools and 19th century jobs. And that's what we did, and we did a really good job. We came out of this a stronger family. We got an awesome husband. I guess my biggest regret is uh, the fact that we weren't able to, to pull together as, as much as maybe we could have. I guess I wish that we could have just been more like that big happy family that we all thought it was going to be, but maybe that's not reality.
Think you have the gumption and grit to survive on the range? Saddle up for a visit to Texas Ranch House at pbs.org. While you're there, get tips to start your own PBS program club with friends and family. We'll sing the chorus. We all feel really fine. Did you know in the cattle drive, Sean got a hold of the secret nacho recipe book? Did you know? Did you know that Sean also has a seasoning with special insect wing seasoning yeah. that he adds sometimes to burritos? Can I get it? Can I get it? Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you know that Sean often works his butt off long into the night to uh, put those winged in insects in into his food? Funding for Texas Ranch House is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.